still chiming in. I'm going to give people a couple of minutes because um, some people are coming from one class to another. Yeah, sure. But, it's funny, uh, as many times as I've done this, it never ceases to be slightly surreal. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like being on the Martian rover, Perseverance or something. <laughs> well, welcome. I'm so glad we're able to do this. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. Yeah. Is this how you guys are holding all of your classes at this point? Uh, most. There's uh, about 400 students that come to campus throughout the week. Uh, the only course in our, a couple courses in the visual and performing arts department, which uh, the illustrators are part of, um, the video uh, department portion of uh, classes meet on campus because that's it's heavy equipment and they really need to learn how to use it. And, and uh, sure. so they're, they're meeting um, on campus. The rest of us are all kind of doing this, <laughs> you know, it turns out. Well, as, as crappy as this whole year has been and difficult as it has, it's been, <clears throat> can you imagine if we didn't have this technology? Yeah. You know, it would have been literally sending a letter one week and then getting a letter the next week. And <clears throat> um, so as bad as it has been, I'm sort of grateful that it's 2021 and not 1921, you know? <laughs> it wouldn't have happened. We're gonna, we would put the map, the, the mailman crazy as it is. I, I send a lot of snail mail and um, I think more people are doing that these days than in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. I, I started, I did this little exercise at the beginning of the quarantine, which maybe I'll talk about in a little bit, but um, mm -hmm. I had four postcards from this series of isolation sketchbook spreads made and I posted something on Instagram and Facebook offering to send people a postcard, period. You know, I wasn't trying to sell them anything. I wasn't trying to get anything. I wasn't gonna share their personal information. I was just gonna send them a postcard. And this last spring, I sent that postcard to Indonesia, Bali, Scott, everywhere, all 50 states and most, mm -hmm. most co continents in the world. It was kind of a fun experiment. And people would send me a photograph of the postcard sitting on their kitchen table in Vietnam or whatever. Beautiful. Um, it's like, so, yeah, kind of like mail art, you know, like the old mail art days. Yeah, sure. There's something, well, and I, we're human beings and I don't think technology is ever going to take that out of us. You know, we have a desire to have a real human connection, you know? Well, let's just see here. It looks like I've got most of my students in attendance. There's a, we actually have a, a couple of professors and um, our president or acting president of the colleges with us today. Oh, no. Uh, Kate Douglas. Yeah. Now I'm nervous. Yeah. Oh, don't be nervous. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for letting me know. Jonathan, I'm looking forward to your presentation. That's oh, wonderful. Great. Thanks for uh, sitting in with us. Yeah. Um, I have to say that the Monroe, institutions like Monroe have a kind of a soft spot in my heart. Uh, my mom was a librarian at a state college in Bismarck, North Dakota for almost 40 years. And so I spent a lot of Sunday evenings with her roaming the halls. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I like, I like institutions like that. And I kind of have a hunch that once this miserable period is over, I mean, there's definitely going to be a reshuffling of higher ed, you know, and, and how it fits in. And I, I think that there's a real spot for two-year community colleges to play a real vital role in higher education, at least I hope so. Um, Kathy, can you can you remind me? Um, we talked a little bit last week when we were rescheduling who, who I'm speaking with today in terms of classes. It's is it a little bit of a mix? It's a little bit of a mix. What we have is a introduction to commercial illustration. Uh, that's my class. Uh, Franji Welgen has invited his art essentials class, uh, which are um, beginner uh, people just you know trying art uh, art out for the first time. Um, and we have a few other students from my art seminar class, which is a portfolio class, almost a, a capstone class for all of the visual artists on campus. And 
uh, I believe a couple illustration, illustration students from commercial illustration too. So um, I'm just kind of looking around the room here and all of my students are here. Um, we have an English professor, uh, Tony Laiozzi, who's a chairperson as well. Um, I was talking to him about your book, The uh, uh, Badlands Saloon. Uh, and, Tony, um, Tony I, can, I can see you on the screen now. Um, I was just reading a Paris Review interview yesterday with George Saunders, and I didn't realize or I had forgotten that David Foster Wallace had written Infinite Chess there in Rochester. Yeah? I didn't know that I don't follow I don't follow him as a writer. I know I'm one of the one of the one of the very few who don't read him, but uh, um, no, that's that's fine. I, I I've got a couple of his books, George Saunders. Um, George Saunders is fantastic. I meant David Foster Wallace. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I've got Infinite Jest, and I loyally sat with two bookmarks, one of the errata at the back of the novel, and then with the novel itself, and I um, I took it as almost an intellectual challenge just to read the damn thing. I'm doing the same thing right now, actually. Oh, good for you. <laughs> We're way through it. Oh, awesome, awesome. Um, you should check out, um, there's a wonderful uh, interview book um, with David Lipsky, L-I-P-S-K-Y. Um, he was a writer for Rolling Stone at the time, and he went on the, the book tour, the first part of the book tour with David Foster Wallace after when Infinite Jest came out. And it's called, um, the title of the book, I believe, is um, Of Course You End Up Becoming Yourself. It's a spec, I, it's almost, as, it's almost a, a different kind of read, but as good as Infinite Jest itself, I think you'd love it. Well, <clears throat> just to kind of do a, a short little introduction anyway, uh, this is being recorded, folks, so um, watch your P's and Q's, as they say. The... Um, uh, the way I met Jonathan was actually through social media, uh, kind of followed him on Instagram and, and Facebook and, you know, really respond to his artwork and, you know, bought a few of his sort of self-published books, as well as the, um, the one I mentioned uh, that was on the poster, the Badlands uh, Saloon, which is hysterically funny if you say I am funny at the same time. <laughs> um, so if you're into a read and I'm going to try to get the MCC library to actually, you know, buy the book and have it you know, on our racks. Um, but anyway, uh, just loving the work and knowing that our students uh, are looking all the time to try to get inspiration. And so I thought I'd uh, invite Jonathan to, to class and uh, he's got, uh, you have the opportunity to share your screen if you want to do that or just walk around the room and show what you got hanging on the wall or um, <laughs> we'll, leave it as, we'll leave it up to you because I know you're a, a, a very good presenter and have taught at numerous colleges as well. Um, his degree, uh, his master's degree is from uh, School of Visual Arts in New York and um, comes to us from Bismarck, North Dakota. Well, I'm in Jersey City. Jersey City um, now. Yeah. Um, technically, I've lived, I've lived longer in New, York, in, in New York City than I had grew up in Bismarck. Um, but yeah, just uh, uh, briefly about myself, my wife and I, Helen, about a little over two years ago, moved across the river to uh, Jersey City. So from the roof of our building, we can see the Statue of Liberty and One World Trade Center, Lower Manhattan. But for the 20 years before that, we were in a pre-war building in Upper Manhattan, a neighborhood called Washington Heights. Um, so that's where I've lived for, I lived in Manhattan for almost a quarter century before coming over here. But I was born and raised in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. As I said, my mom was a college librarian and my dad's a retired art um, high school teacher. Uh, so words and pictures have always sort of figured into my life uh, along the way. Um, and, and kind of why I wanted to know who I was speaking with today because I, I will talk about my illustration work, but um, I sort of backed into that. And on some level, I don't even necessarily consider myself a straight illustrator per se. Um, I think like a lot of artists, I guess, historically speaking, I kind of pop around and do a lot of different things, apply my art to a lot of different um, things. You know, I think Leonardo did that, um, Picasso did that, Milton Glaser is a great contemporary example of people doing that. Um, but I, I went to a four-year state school in Moorhead, Minnesota, that happened to have a strong art department and a great uh, li English literature department. And I had an absolute field day um, with the liberal arts education. Um, it was 
um, I'm always touting the value of that rather than a, a necessarily a straight art school education. Or not that there's anything wrong with an art school education, but what I got out of the liberal arts experience. But January of my senior year, it occurred to me that a BA in drawing probably wasn't going to carry a lot of water in the world, and I should see what else I, I could do. But, but I wasn't dead set on going to graduate school just for the sake of earning an MFA. So um, I was making ramen noodles in the art department little kitchen area one cold winter night in January. And while the microwave was going, I found a catalog for this program at the School of Visual Arts that Marshall Arisman founded. Um, it's um, in it, he was describing this program. It's an illustration program, but it was much more of a studio practice. It wasn't like a commercial art program. Um, it was about narrative. It was about the, the human figure. And he wrote in that catalog, for those artists who believe that creativity is not the sole province of the fine artist, we offer this program in illustration. And I thought, aha, that sounds perfect. Because um, I had never, um, uh, I was a figurative artist and a narrative artist, but I had never considered illustration. Um, Henrik Drescher, I don't know if you guys know Henrik's work. Um, I, I know him a little bit. He and his wife, Wu, live over in Brooklyn now. They, he's been a gypsy, kind of nomadic throughout his life, but Henrik was on my radar. Uh, Ralph Stedman, um, I found a book of his when I was a sophomore in high school in Minneapolis. And as much as his drawings inspired me, um, just the notion that a person could write and illustrate a book that wasn't a children's book, um, that was a big inspiration. But other than those two guys, I wasn't like, I wasn't, I, I love Norman Rockwell, but he wasn't necessarily what I was aspiring to. I was more interested in, in Picasso and Van Gogh and Rauschenberg and Leonard Baskin's great. Um, so anyway, I sent this um, application off and I was accepted as the token Midwesterner in the program and my mom made me come. <laughs> um, so I moved to New York and uh, people back home always ask me, you know, how long are you gonna stay in New York, John? And I said, well, I could only afford a one-way ticket. So I guess I'm just saving up for the return. And uh, I still guess I'm kind of saving up. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so it was a two-year graduate program and uh, I wasn't ready for prime time when I graduated, but I didn't, I, I always joke that not only did I not have a plan B, I didn't really have a plan A. Um, I just wanted to draw. And I was, I was, that's all I ever, ever want to do. You can ask Helen, which she's very gracious in putting up with my drawing habit. Um, so I just would show my portfolio around everywhere to anybody who would look. And I was lucky enough to get work right out of, out of the gate. Um, but over the years, I've, I've, I've done a lot of editorial illustration, with, which I'll share a little bit uh, with you today. Um, we could talk a little bit about style. That tends to be a, a hang up for especially illustrators, but artists in general. And for those people uh, on the call today who aren't necessarily in the illustration wheelhouse, I think because of my background, I can sort of speak to you as well and that I'm, yes, I've, <laughs> I've made drawings for money, but I'm not necessarily a commercial artist, if, if that makes any sense at all. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about process. And then I've got some physical things that I'll show. And, and maybe at the end, we can just open it up and be a little more conversational because uh, this will be semi-casual, but um, I'm gonna share my screen with you. <clears throat> there we go. Is that clear, guys? OK, um, so I want to actually just share my website um, and use it as sort of a PowerPoint tool. I've done that uh, a lot in quarantine and with classes this way. And it's kind of a nice way to, um, you know, aside from putting together a PowerPoint or a keynote, this is a little more organic and it allows us to talk about stuff as it comes up. Also, and, and I realize that I might be a little bit <clears throat> Um, the challenge of this, but I, I try to keep my website active, um, updated, a sort of a, a, a fresh place with material and, and curate it to a certain level to encourage people to return. Um, if you go to Instagram to check out my work at John Twingley, um, that's cool, but I know human nature too. And after about 30 seconds with my work, you're going to be down a rabbit hole somewhere else. 
And so just for professional reasons, if I can get people to visit my website, I can kind of direct them towards maybe a project that I'm working on at the moment, or um, in this case, there's a, a, a catalog collections shop that I have set up, but we'll just look at my general portfolio. And, and like I said, it's it looked 100% different six months ago, either in terms of how I've, what which work I've chosen to feature or highlight. Um, but I'm gonna start by just looking at some of the, um, uh, the illustration work um, <clears throat> and just talking a little bit about these projects. I'm not gonna talk about every single one. And if somebody does have a question, please uh, feel free to just cut me off, but um, we, can, <clears throat> we can have questions at the end too. The, this project um, was a recent one from last month in a, a magazine uh, which is really great because these images already existed. Um, the, the, the project came in around Christmas time, the holidays, and it was sort of uh, the art director was in a little bit of a pinch to find art and asked if I happened to have anything. Oh, and I should, I should begin the talk too, or at least premise all this. There's basically two tenets that I've kind of built my entire creative life on. And, and you'll see that as I talk about these um, individual projects. Um, one is a firm belief in making a lot of work when nobody's looking. Um, whether you're a student, you know, and you have to do an assignment, yeah, sure, but an assignment is just an excuse to do something cool or interesting. Um, and I've never been, I never like send out promotional materials or emails and then just sit there and wait for somebody to commission me to make a drawing or a painting. Um, when we're finished here today, I'll be over at the easel or sitting and drawing or doing something, you know, I just making a lot of work when no one's looking. That's critical, especially for the young people on our call today. Um, and then secondly, is make work you really care about and then figure out what it is or find a home for it. Um, I think in my experience in the classroom, I was a um, senior lecturer at University of the Arts in, in uh, Philadelphia for the past 12 years. And my one experience with students is it's so easy to get hung up on either looking at Instagram and being like, oh, wow, that artist has X number of followers or that artist is doing this kind of work or style or using this medium. Maybe I should do that. Um, it's, it's easy to get distracted by all that stuff. And I think it's so important to uh, make work that you really care about and then figure out you know, where that goes. If you really love mixed martial arts, go for it you know, dive into it a thousand percent. <clears throat> but anyway, these are, uh, these, these pictures uh, were, this, this opening spread was a sketchbook spread from a sketchbook, which I'll show you later. Um, the article was about mental health issues amongst homeless populations. Um, the one slightly disconcerting thing about that subject matter in these pictures is these pictures are more or less self portraits. Um, so I guess, well, we all have mental health issues, don't we? <laughs> but it was a thrill to see these drawings that I made just for myself when nobody was looking um, printed. That, that somehow never gets old. And one thing I'll talk about in a little bit too is a little bit of, on the notion of style. Um, I'm a pen and ink person for the most part, but for the first 10 years of the 20s, the 2000s, um, I was painting acrylic on unstretched canvas, which is how the Badlands Saloon was executed. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but I've always been a line person in drawing. And I think it's because drawing is a lot like writing and it kind of blends these two worlds that I, words and pictures. Uh, but with this piece here in the hat, um, I used frisket to mask off certain areas. And then with a brayer and acrylic paint applied acrylic paint to the ink drawings. And so it's almost like a hybrid of a painting and a drawing. Um, uh, back in March, an art director for Politico who was based in, um, in Northern Europe, I can't remember the country. He had reached out to about 20 artists from around the world just to get like what's quarantine or what's isolation been like for you so far. And so this uh, drawing, um, all boxed in, came from the same sketchbook as this drawing, actually. And they were both made five years ago in 2015, but it all of a sudden had an application to our current situation of being, you know, all boxed in. Um, 
and that's another thing you'll see pop up in the work is the importance of the sketchbook. Um, I've always used sketchbooks sort of as ends in and of themselves and not just, I mean, I have some sketchbooks which are just notes and doodles and stuff, but I often, like this was a piece uh, two years ago for the Pennsylvania Gazette. It was a, a short essay written by an alumni who had taken a class with Philip Roth. And after Philip Roth died, she was just remembering a difficult time she had gone through and how um, Philip Roth was very open to listening to her and just and kind of working through her problems with her. And so I, I proposed like, doing this kind of fractured portrait in a book itself and print the book as an object because it almost felt like a, a journal or a diary entry. And since the article was quite confessionary, um, it seemed to, to fit the bill. Walt Whitman's 200th birthday a year and a half ago. This was another case where I had done that drawing and then Kathy Gonteric, the art director called because she knew that I like literature and said, would you like to do a portrait of Whitman? And I said, Kathy, I just did one yesterday. Would you like to run it? And that's, and so that kind of gets to the, like the commercial artist. I kind of have a foot in a, a couple different worlds when it comes to being a traditional illustrator or just a, a drawer. I think I'll talk about this one in a couple minutes in the process section because this was an interesting project. This, it's a David painting, The Death of Socrates, that I had done in a sketchbook again, but applied to this really interesting article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which I've worked for um, quite a bit over the last decade, I would say. And I actually still um, read it pretty much every morning on my phone, even though I'm not teaching this year, just because it it's kind of a, keeps a thumb on the pulse of, of higher ed. Teacher evaluations. <laughs> Can relate to that. <laughs> I have a, an old childhood friend, my oldest friend since I was three. He's a professor um, at a, a university in Bismarck. And he, this was laying on his desk one day, this uh, issue of the Chronicle. And he turns it and he's like, hey, there's John. <clears throat> These are all from the Chronicle. And this one was interesting in 2012. I, I talked a little bit ago about having painted for the first 10 years of, of this century um, pretty strictly. And I, I'm really grateful that I did a deep dive into just kind of straight acrylic painting, but I, I kept the call to line again and just a directness of drawing. And um, this was kind of a, a in-between uh, period where this is a, a larger image. Um, and it's acrylic on board. So I would water down the acrylic to more of almost an ink consistency. And then I would sharpen a broad brush. So it had a, with literally with an X-Acto blade and then draw with the acrylic paint. Um, so I was kind of like tra transitioning out of the, uh, the traditional use of acrylic paint back towards more linear approach. I don't know if there are any football fans on the call, but Carson Wentz went to the same high school I did in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, and he won five consecutive national championships with, the univer or with North Dakota State University. And this was on the occasion of that fifth one in 2016. And their, their mascot is a bison and their school colors are yellow and green. <clears throat> so it was kind of ironic when I was teaching down in Philly on South Broad Street, just a couple miles south was the stadium where Carson Wentz played. And then he and I both came from Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, so full circle. Another hybrid where I was literally drawing elements and then cutting them out and mounting them onto an illustration board that had been textured with acrylic paint and gesso. And now I, I actually have really, I, I really love drawing on the iPad, to be honest with you. And you could do stuff like this using the iPad digitally much more efficiently than doing it analog like I'm doing. Um, but as much as I love drawing on, and maybe I'll show you an iPad drawing or two, but as much as I love drawing on the iPad, it had the unintended consequence of 
inspiring my traditional drawings more. And so it just sent me back to ink. And this one was using Photoshop to stitch together. Can you guys see the cursor on the screen? Mm -hmm. okay, yes. So that helps me guide it a little bit. Like this is acrylic um, uh, paint on canvas that the kind of court. And so I was grabbing that from another painting in the studio um, and then digitally dropping it into an ink drawing. Um, and, I, and this one is, is this, uh, this one is all traditional materials mounted. And I'm gonna walk through the process on this one because it was kind of fun and kind of interesting, I think. I did a lot of work for this financial magazine called The Deal. Um, incredibly dry technical financial articles, but the art director was spectacular. And it actually, it started in about 2002 through about 2011 or 12, sometimes weekly. And it really allowed me to, I don't know, kind of develop a, 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 the illustration vocabulary and metaphorical stuff and- um, Jonathan? Yeah. Um, can we go back to that image slightly up where it's the, the cover of the deal? Yep. How would we know? I mean, I've never seen the deal before. Um, and I'm looking at that and I'm thinking it's dialed. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, so are you, uh, is there something in the image that would say deal or is that just predicated on the idea of it be knowing that this is the deal magazine? Well, one thing, the deal was not a newsstand publication. It was only a subscription for like okay. financial institutions. And so I, I think that the art director might have had a little more latitude in the way he covers up the masthead there. Um, yeah, I didn't know if there was something in the hat that suggested an E and I was missing it. Oh, no, no. It's, you know, it's, I've never re actually noticed that, but you're totally right. If you're not familiar with this, there'd be a legibility issue, right? Oh, I, I wasn't even a critique. I wasn't a criticism. I, I love the cover. I just was curious. Yeah, no, it, it's just top hat covering up the E. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question, though. No, I love it, though. It's great. It's funny. I was um, doing a portfolio review in 2002 at the Art Directors Club here in New York. It's one of these deals where it's like a noontime event and you pay like $200 for a spot on one of these tables and you bring with promotional materials and then they encourage art directors and creative directors to come by for a light lunch and then they look at portfolios. Well, when I was sitting there, I looked across the room and there was Paul Davis with his portfolio. And I don't know if you guys know Paul Davis, but he and Milton Glaser and Seymour Quast uh, were all involved with Pushpin Studios back in the 50s and 60s. He's this legendary guy. And I looked across the room and I was like, oh my gosh, if he's here trying to hustle work with his portfolio, what chance do I have? And I later found out that his wife, Myrna Davis, was the executive director of the Art Directors Club at the time. And so he was kind of doing a solid for her by just lending his name and reputation to the event. But I went home that night and called <laughs> old pal of mine and I said, Dan, I just, I, I think this gig is up. I, I don't see how I stand a chance. And Larry Gendron, the art director at the deal happened to have been at that event that day and I didn't know it. And the next day he called me and he's like, you know, are you available to do a job? And, um, and it was a weekly magazine and he paid a thousand bucks a pop, whether he used it as a quarter page or a full page, he paid a little bit more for the cover. Um, but sometimes he would call four times a month. And for a young, in my 20s, you know, when I was cutting my teeth, that was like really important, not only financially, but just having a space where you could play conceptually on a weekly basis and try to figure out how you take abstract concepts and give them uh, a fo um, formal shape. And since it, the articles were quite dry, like this was discussing whether, whether or not the US government should have bailed out Lehman Brothers back in the financial crisis of 2008. So, you know, I have Uncle Sam plugging one ear while this corporate institution is about to take care of himself. Um, so I had a lot of latitude to be playful, be fun. And it was, um, I'm so grateful to Larry and the opportunity. <clears throat> but 
But a lot of these, and it's funny because I, I like doing these talks because it forces me to reconsider, you know, what I'm doing and where I've been. And, um, you know, a lot of these are literally just done for myself or my own pleasure, either pictorially or narratively, and, and then finding some sort of application for the work um, is really fun. I got pegged a little bit as a, a violence guy early on, and I'll explain why in a second, but this was a, a, a magazine called Scenario, obviously, and they published, it was a quarterly, I think, four times a year, and each issue would publish screenplays in their entirety that were related somehow. And so this was four screenplays that were macho tales, and one of them was Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch, which was like one of my favorite movies at the time. And, uh, and I got to do four paintings and a whole bunch of drawings. And they, the thing got published and then they immediately went out of business and it never went to the newsstands and I didn't get paid. Um, but uh, the images got in a lot of the illustration annuals that year and stuff. And so that stuff in my portfolio started to lead to this for, yes, there's actually a magazine called Cowboys and Indians Magazine. Um, and this was top 10 gunfights. And they might have seen this image on my website or something and connected the two. In the same magazine, I did a portrait of Ernest Borgnine. So the violence stuff, um, I'm gonna skip down just a couple because it'll kind of tee this up. And it's, it's tricky looking back on some of this stuff now, 20 years later almost, and some of it may seem insensitive culturally, um, but at the time, for those of you who maybe the students aren't familiar with Salman Rushdie, I don't know if, if, if the younger people are. Salman Rushdie was, I think he's an Indian British writer. Um, I think London was his home base, but in the 1980s, he had written a book called The Satanic Verses, which was critical of, um, or it was deemed critical of Islam by the Ayatollahs in Iran, and they put out a fatwa on him, and he had to live largely, you know, out of sight for about a decade. And um, so after September 11th, the date of this paper, paper is November 2nd, 2001, um, Rushdie wrote this op-ed in the New York Times called, Yes, This Is About Islam, and I was asked to do the op-ed piece for it. And, and then and that came specifically um, after September 11th, living in Manhattan, as I was at the time, <clears throat> um, that was terrifying, you know? It was, it was really an, an unsettling, up on the roof of my building in Washington Heights, you could watch the F-15s circling Manhattan and I could see the two towers of smoke at the bottom end of Manhattan. And, you know, the next week when you'd get on the subway to go downtown and there'd be a weird guy on the subway well, there's always weird guys on the subway, but after that, you're like, is this the next wave? Is this, you know, gonna, are we going to get hit again? Or when planes were coming into New York, when they were allowed to come in again, and they were making their approach to LaGuardia, and you're like, man, that's, it's unsettling, right? And so I just started doing all these drawings, either riffing on photographs I had seen in the New York Times, or from my imagination, just kind of exercising these abstract nerves. And I made simple black and white copies of these drawings, and I sent them to the LA Times, the New York Times, papers around the country, and it wasn't about capitalizing on that situation or that event. And I explained this in a cover letter, I just, I wanted to be a part of the conversation, you know, I wanted to, like, have a place that I could respond to these, you know, this, this, this un these uncertain times. And that's how I started. I've, I've done a, a a fair amount of work with the New York Times, but it led to a much longer um, collaboration with the LA Times. I'd say two, 300 pieces over the years. But then it led to whenever something would come up like um, civil war in Libya, well, call Twingley, he's that guy, or um, torture <clears throat> um, in 2005, call Twingley, <laughs> or when Congress was armed and dangerous, Paul Twingley, or even in the Chronicle of Higher Education, why people kill, Paul Twingley. 
I don't really have a violent bone in my body, but I got pegged somehow as this little one side sh shot. But <clears throat> the New York Times is kind of an example of what I said at the beginning is make work you really care about and then find a home for it. Meaning, you know, work that keeps you or an idea or a subject that and it doesn't have to be profound or, or heavy. I mean, like I said, if you're really into mixed martial arts, that's, that's great, go for it. Um, when they had taken uh, bin Laden out, um, I stayed up that night and did this drawing and then sold it to the Dallas Morning News and the LA Times. Um, this was another one I did uncommissioned um, just well, six years ago now, but ISIS, in the Middle East, well, I'd see these photos on the news and it was like Mad Max, these characters um, heavily armed and running around. And so I just did this drawing. And I, at that point I had a, a relationship with the art director, Wes, at the LA Times and I could just email him and say, maybe you'll have a use for it. And he was like, yeah, that's perfect. Um, I liked the way this one came out on the page when they were choosing a new Pope Obviously, the cardinals elect the pope, but I had the hand of God dropping this hat down from the heavens. Back during the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, the bird's nest. And Obama's very popular campaign that year. So mainly, mainly um, editorial, newspapers, uh, magazines, but there's a book cover. <clears throat> I like doing portraits to a degree, if, if, it, if, the, if, if it works out right. This was for Jazz Is Magazine. I love jazz, always have. This is the last one. So that's that's a, a real quick over, or maybe not so quick. I'm trying to keep an eye on the time a little bit. Um, kind of an overview of some of my editorial work. Um, maybe we'll segue into then the process behind that editorial work. One thing I'll say too, and especially to those listening today who aren't like committed to illustration per se, when I left graduate school, because it was very much a studio practice program, um, there were two things that I wanted to do is work big. And I didn't wanna do any preparatory sketches of any kind. I just wanted to ink on paper and have it be alive and in the moment. Well, to work professionally for the New York Times or whoever, you have to send sketches Sometimes they might ask for a change or a tweak, and then you, you do the approved one, and you know there's a process. And I had to trick myself into figuring out a way into that process where the sketches, you know, I, I could get into the sketch part of it. And um, and it's it's evolved for me over the years. And I still joke with illustration students when I'm in the classroom that when an email pings through and it's you know quite you know are you available for illustration or something my stomach like churns a little bit because I'm like, oh man, what am I going to do? Um, and then you just kind of figure it out. This is this was an interesting assignment that came through um, end of last summer. It was going to be not, no, 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 not end of last. Well, yeah, it was actually August, July, August, because it was for the November issue, the election issue of the Atlantic. And it was a profile of 14 of the administrations just kind of key figures and then they were going to profile each one. <clears throat> and so it was going to be 14 portraits. And I, with, with portraits, I've really, for a long time now, I've tried to avoid doing sketches because I'll put in time doing a sketch for a portrait and attaining a likeness. And then if I submit that, they say, okay. And then you basically just redrawing it again. The second time always ends up becoming just stiff and like dead and so I've, I've tried to get work with art directors and have them trust me enough where once we establish what we're doing, I can just go and do the drawing because I'm almost 
sure all the time that the portrait will be better if I just draw it without doing a, pre a preliminary sketch. So I asked the art director where, what, where her head was at in relation to my work. And it was so cool because she sent me these two links to Instagram posts I had done at the time. And they were both sketchbook drawings. This one of Edgar Allan Poe and this one of the ba ballerina, Misty Copeland. And I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. Cause I like those drawings and you wouldn't have thought of that in terms of, of the Trump squad, but um, I thought, okay, aesthetically, now I know where, what she's thinking and now I'll, I'll proceed from there. At the time I was doing all these portraits of Richard Avedon um, photographs um, because somehow his drawing, his photographs against the white background are kind of like ink drawings. They're black and white, they're on a white background. And I was just doing drawings of his photographs. And I shared this photo with the art director saying, these kind of feel like they could be the Trump people, you know, just like in, in terms of their, their feel, their, um, <clears throat> the world that they're inhabiting. So she was all on board with that. So I just went ahead and she had initially, her and the editors had conceived of this as like 14 vignetted Daumier like portraits of the, this group of people. So I, I did all 14 portraits, just straight, no sketches. Um, and I don't do any pencil sketches either. I, I just generate the, um, I get my reference material actually um, by pulling up YouTube interviews. And then I do screenshots. And so you get the faces like that one of Mnuchin in the middle, you know, with his mouth partly open, you get these kind of little nuanced like expressions that you wouldn't get if you just Googled an image of that guy or that woman. And so I did them. And then in Photoshop, I stitched everything together because they decided they wanted more of an organic group portrait. And so I was like, okay, I can do that with Photoshop. Um, and then I went ahead and digitally applied this brayered red to each one individually. So they were able to use each one individually on the website, the Atlantic website. And then the portrait ran in the magazine. And with these two, um, I, I don't really, I've done a lot of caricature in the traditional sense of the word, but I think the, the more I've gone, um, my, my approach now to doing a portrait is to just try to draw it straight and let the inherent inaccuracies in my drawing be the style or be the distortion. Um, I mean, we're all goofy, right? Just as, as we are. and. You know, so just like get out of the way and let Mnuchin be Mnuchin. And I don't really have to like ham it up or exaggerate too much. <clears throat> and then finally on this project, uh, they were gonna run a key, some key art. So, you know, like where they do just the uh, silhouette um, of the group portrait with a number where each of the characters is going to be and then they could have a little pull quote. I'd never done that before so I imported the, um, the final art into my uh, Procreate on my iPad Pro and then using an Apple Pencil just uh, did a drawing around um, the group. Uh, so that was kind of a fun experience too of using the digital technology as a, a really useful tool. And that's where it looked like in the magazine at the end. It's so nice to see the process, I think, because that's what we're all about, you know, as students, you know. And well, right. nice no, I agree. That. And I think, I think a lot of times we think the process is like a commercial art, like an aspect of commercial art. And I always use Picasso's Guernica as an example um, of process. It's amazing to think that two weeks before the World's Fair in Paris in 1936, Picasso hadn't touched that canvas. Um, and it's huge. It's like 18 feet by 11 feet or something. It's massive. And he hadn't touched, he was a little guy. He was 5'3". So he had a lot of ground to cover on that big canvas. But what he had done in the months leading up to that was had, he had done upwards of 800 drawings related to that painting in terms of characters and interactions and themes. And so when he, when he hit it, he had a pretty solid idea of where he was going. Um, so that, that that's its own kind of preparation and Picasso was hardly an illustrator. 
Hey, Jonathan? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Fonzie. I'm an a art teacher here, and thanks for uh, sharing your stuff with our class. I just wanted to have a little comment about um, your last piece with the, uh, the Legion of Doom, so to speak, if you can, if you can scroll up to your piece on the, the, the Trump and Friends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm just like looking at that and looking at um, your pieces that you shared with us up until this point. And it's really interesting the way that, of course, like Kathy said, you described the process and, and helped share that vision that art simply doesn't grow on trees. It goes through a process. So that was really cool to, to see. But stylistically, I find this one really, really impressive because it's on one hand, much tighter than most of the other stuff that you showed before. But when you showed each individual one, um, uh, like a minute ago, I was really able to um, lock on to the contours of like Betsy DeVos's uh, lapels and Stephen Miller's uh, ears and hair. And there's this really weird um, sort of state of, of like a, a, a jello mold being left on, uh, outside on a picnic table on a 90 degree day. There's, a, there's an uncertainty about the makeup of that line and, and it being a solid thing and it's forever changing. And it really, that aspect of it to me, that look of this, this line, this fluctuating line and all these characters, perfectly goes with with all the nonsense and and objectionable stuff that they put us through in the last four years did did that just fall into place or as you were making these did you actually think about every time that you witnessed these people and heard their 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 uh, news briefings and what they shoveled out to the public was that was that a i mean i know you said the the, the joke sort of right itself here <laughs> for these individuals but i just i tend to notice it's so effective that way and and scary at the same time um and and how these are perceived as as me being a first time audience member of this portrait no, that, those are great observations. I love the jello mold analogy. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> well, it's, it's funny with drawings, you know, and I think I get that all the time and I, when we make drawings, whether it's in a life drawing class and the model comes and looks at it and she's like, you know, do you think that's what I look like? And you, you're like, no, I, it, um, there's only, there's a, a, a point to which I don't think any of us can claim credit to what happens in these situations. You know, I think you, you try to, you ballpark at the beginning with the planning and with this project in particular, this isn't necessarily, this isn't probably a good textbook um, example of process to share with like a young illustrator because, you know, I skipped some steps here. I didn't do a preparatory sketch of the portrait, which a lot of people would. Um, like, do you guys know John Cuneo's work? Yeah. Um, he and I are pretty good pals. I mean, I shouldn't say he's, he's such a hermit. I don't know how close he is with anybody. He just lives in a studio making these little perverted drawings. But um, like, I love seeing his process because his, his, um, he does like a very loose kind of shaky sketch and he'll submit that to an art director. And then he'll do, he'll, he'll trace that or put it on a, a light table, I believe, a light box he uses. And then he'll tighten it up, you know, and kind of, I didn't do that with these. And so, um, and as I said, I like Philip Burke's another guy, and I think he lives up in your neck of the woods. Uh, he's uh, from Buffalo. Buffalo, right, right. Yeah. Um, he and I interact on social media a bit. I've never had the chance to meet him, but I've adored his work since he's one of the illustrators who really was on my radar when I was 18, 19, 20. Um, and he, he uses ex, um, exaggeration, strategic exaggeration to such a killer T. I mean, just brilliantly. And I'm, I'm kind of going the opposite way with this project where it wasn't like, oh, let me accentuate Pompeo's third chin or, or no chin, whatever. Um, I just kind of drew the guy. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting. I should just keep my mouth shut and agree with you and say, yep, that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I can't, I really, I think that there's a point where you, 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 you take in what the larger project is, um, and then you kind of, you try to tee up elements, and then you just, I have this um, post-it note that I, in my studio, it says, move the pen, it knows what to do. And I think just tr trusting instinct, and, and, th and this is a good point, that I'm glad you brought that up for, for younger students, again, who are listening today, 
everybody, we all get hung up with style, right? Like, oh, what's my style? Or he has such a style, or she has such a style. Um, you all have a style right now, you know? It's like my voice, I'm not talking like this. Um, that would be like affectation. I'm, I'm, I can't make my voice not do this thing that it's doing. And I think all of us have that. And, and surely the longer we live and the, the greater my vocabulary is and whatever, you know, your voice gets honed and it gets more you as you do this more. But I, I've more, as I've developed, I've tried to get out of the way of style things and just make drawing or just do, you know, whatever and trust that whatever makes my drawing particular to me will, will come through. So I think the style thing, or I mean, the process thing is maybe useful. Can I do two more? And then we'll just kind of maybe, sure. it's yeah. uh, one, it's 150. I don't want to like, because once I get going, I can go a little bit. So um, I'll well, just- Well, class yeah. doesn't technically end until three, but you know, I don't want to overwork you either. No, no. I mean, as long as, as long as I'm not putting people to sleep. <clears throat> I'm um, keeping an eye on. <laughs> Um, all right, I'll just briefly go through these two projects because I think they're they interesting in terms of pro, uh, process. As I said, I had done this drawing. Actually, I'll show it to you. And I'll use, after this, we'll segue into a couple of these books. Um, you guys can still see me on the screen as well. This was 2015, so again, five, six years ago. This is that drawing. And it was just an exercise one day, I, this painting by David, um, which I think is hanging at the Met here in New York. But anyway, the only, again, no pencil down. I wasn't trying to copy the original per se. Um, the only rule I had for myself was every element in the original painting had to get on that sketchbook page. And that forced me like, I don't have the original, but um, the, um, Socrates is not that large in the original. He's quite quite small in the middle, but I wanted to focus on Socrates. And then this little character way in the distance there, waving at the, at the viewer, that's actually in the painting. And so I just did this painting of Socrates. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is Socrates about to drink hemlock and commit suicide rather than commit, um, rather than admit to committing a crime he didn't believe he committed. And so there was this article for the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it was about um, um, trigger warnings, you know, and how certain works of literature or in poetry or whatever, there might be a violent passage or there might be something about, you know, something that might trigger memories in a student that are unpleasant. And the, our, the writer of this essay was actually arguing that well, perhaps all great works of literature were the result of trauma, you know, and that the writer had to do this to exercise that trauma, as I discussed before. And so he talked about Ovid, the Roman poet philosopher, um, Ovid, is that right? He had been banished from Rome, and we're still not totally sure why he had been banished for, from Rome. Um, I think I say it says right here, yeah, it, uh, the only clue we have is in Ovid's own words, Carmen et error, a poem and a mistake. And so he has to leave Rome. Um, <clears throat> and so the article was asking, should, should we um, protect students from these perhaps violent situations? And I had been reading King Lear at the time, Shakespeare, and I thought, um, you know, what if, uh, the Earl of Gloucester after his eyes being gouged out of his head, you know, as a kid reading that, that that's pretty traumatic, you know, should we edit that part out of King Lear, um, blindfold the student, or is it the administrator or teacher's job in the first place to censor work, or, or is that part of education for a student to work through those things? And here's the original of David. <clears throat> In the article, it suggested, it referred to Plato and how the death of Plato's teacher had effectively inspired Plato's entire life of the mind, his writing of the Republic, everything. 
And it didn't mention Socrates by name, but I knew that Socrates had been Plato's teacher. And I had this drawing in a sketchbook of Socrates, you know, making this kind of statement in his own death. And I suggested that we pair that with this article about protecting students from trigger. Uh, Ovid had no trigger warning. So anyway, getting back to that thing at the beginning, you know, making work you really care about and making a lot of work when no one's looking and just be ready, you know, when opportunities present themselves. And this is the last one I'll, I'll talk about in the um, process section, because again, I think it's kind of a fun process. Um, the image itself was a total experiment. It was for Malibu magazine um, out in California. It was a double page spread for an article about um, um, traffic congestion creeping up the Pacific Coast Highway. And, um, <clears throat> and there was not much of a budget for this job, which was sort of frustrating because Malibu is a very wealthy zip code. But um, I've not turned down a lot of work over my career. I've, I've more so tried to see it, um, you know, approach it as if like, what could I do with this? And so this didn't have a huge budget, but I took it on because I was experimenting with this hybrid drawing painting approach at the time. And I thought this, I could use this project as an opportunity to try that approach. And this is more of a traditional example of an illustration gig, like how it works, thumbnails, sketches, et cetera. And this is often how it starts with me in a sketchbook in my lap, just doing doodles that are basically notes to myself. Um, this is a guy surfing on a row of cars and you'll see all of these. So then I start sketching and this was how I got into making sketches years ago is I sit down and do them on fairly nice sheets of Bristol paper and I do it with a dip pen. And the idea is, is they're almost like drawings themselves. You know, I mean, finished drawings themselves. Um, and that got me to put in the time to the sketch phase. Whereas if I just do like a rough ballpoint pen sketch, like my heart's not in it and it's just, it's not gonna sell the idea. So I just do these kind of finished little quick drawings. Like this one, I'd actually like to um, just bring into Procreate and do a digital coloring of it because the line work is all kind of locked in. But so this guy is surfing a wave of cars. Here's a beach bum holding back a um, wave of traffic. Same idea in stereo. Here's more of like a hipster and then a more abstract conceptually wave of cars. The old stuck up a tree trick. And then I did this one and I, I kind of felt like this one was gonna be the one, but I always try to do one more after that. And I had this little weird dude in a sketchbook that I just copied out and then put in a landscape and had a whole bunch of cars. And it didn't make any sense conceptually, but that's usually the ones I like best because they're not, they're not such an obvious answer. But the art director did choose this one. So um, <clears throat> at that point, I suggested, well, hey, since the budget's not that good, why don't I do a whole bunch of sketches and offer to hand letter the title of the article? Um, just out of spite, you know? Um, and so the article was called No Way Out. And the thing with hand lettering is you never get it right the first time. You sort of have to like do it a whole bunch of times. And I was doing these and my wife comes into the studio and I'm sitting there with all these sheets on the floor. It's just say, no way out, no way out, no way out. And she's like, you know, is everything cool in here? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, yeah, the credits of the author of the article and myself. And this is the part, this is the part that nobody ever sees with, with these projects is this is the iceberg below the, the, the piece, you know, is it's all this stuff that you do to get to that piece. And this is a more maybe um, traditional example of process in relation to editorial illustration. But I was even drawing the cars individually and then I would scan them, print them out on archival photo paper after I'd hit them with some photo, stupid Photoshop gradient colors and then mount those with matte medium onto this it's such a hybrid. It's almost stupid how hybrid it is because you can do it this so much more easy on, you know, digitally. But, and then that's the finished spread.
Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, it was, it was a, as I said, the, I like the image well enough, but it almost the process was more interesting and I, you learn from it. Um, I often envy those illustrators, uh, you know, like Philip Burke. Um, I mean, he's, he is so good. I mean, just brilliant painter. Um, but the crazy thing is, is you look at his stuff from 1992 or from 19 or from 2015 and the, it's like, it's all great. It's so consistent. And I, I tend to be a different kind of artist where I'm restless and I, um, my, my stuff has changed a lot over the years. And I'm gonna fast forward here and go to one more section to tell another story on that note real quick. Oops. Portfolio. So yeah, this was a book, this was published in 2009. And so this was what my work looked like the first decade, as I've discussed. It was a large acrylic paintings on unstretched canvas. Um, and it's a shortish novel. It's only about 50,000 words, but then there are the 42 of these double page spread paintings. So telling this story, which it was very autobiography, pretty much straight autobiography about this kid in, in the summer between his two years in graduate school in New York City, goes back home to North Dakota and works at his friend's bike shop in a fictional Western North Dakota town called Marysville. And this is his friend, Tank Wilson. And then he goes into the Badland Saloon there in Marysville and meets this cast of characters in this little small town. And the He's kind of the centerpiece of the story, Willie Beck. That's him uttering his barbaric yawp. Um, so yeah, this was a, this was utterly a dream project, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll end this phase of it. And we can just talk a little bit, but um, I'll end with a, a brief story on this, um, how it came about. My my wife had been working a, a corporate gig and her job one day, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but she had this uh, email list of literary agents that she was using in relation to what she was doing at work. And at like five o'clock, she opened up a new email and in the subject line just typed www.twingly.com, drug a few images from my site into the email and then sent it to that list of literary agents with nothing else. And I started getting phone calls from New York and Boston and San Francisco, like, oh, I don't know who Helen Putnam is, but you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I called her at work and I said, Helen, what the hell is going on? And she's just real quiet. She's like, why? And then I tell her, I'm getting all these calls from literary agents. So anyway, I, I um, talked with this guy named Farley Chase. It's a wonderful name, right? Um, he was at a Waxman Literary Agency in New York at the time, and this is 2007. And he had called and said, you know, I saw your work and liked it and wondered if you'd ever considered doing a graphic novel. And I said, well, I'm not, I would, I'm not really a comics guy at this point anyway, but um, all I've ever wanted to do is write and illustrate my own book. And I had this painting, the one that's in the book was already done in 2007. I had had all these paintings around on sheets of masonite in my studio, starting to tell this story of these characters in a fictional place, but I hadn't written a word. So I tore him off the masonite boards and went to his office and just started telling him the story in his conference room of these characters. And he was like, that's it. Um, let's put together a dummy, a, a, like a, a digital proposal, a PDF. And he shopped it around, found a young editor at Scribner, no less. Um, I was just in heaven, you know, Scribner's who published Hemingway in the 20s, you know, it was like, wow. Um, so anyway, she took a chance on me. It was like taking a camel and threading it through the eye of a needle to get such an unconventional book, which was ultimately the challenge, you know, it, where do we put it in Barnes and Noble? Because it's not a picture book, you know, it's not a kid's book. Um, but yeah. Where'd they end up putting it? Well, I had originally designed it to be like a coffee table book, like an art book size uh, with the big paintings and words. And on our very first meeting, Anna, the editor said, 
we should do this as a six by nine inch traditional hardback book because then it'll fit on the bookshelf next to Twain, you know, mm -hmm. Twainly, Twain. And she had a good point. And so we went that route, but it was, it was, it was pretty intense. Um, you know, I've, I'd never written a novel before. So it was, it was quite an adventure, but I've, I've always, I've written a lot and it, it was, yeah. Okay. Um, Franzi, I think we should get the book for the, um, the library that the section with the graphic novels. What do you think? You got it. Okay. It's pretty readily available on yeah. Amazon still, I think. Yeah, we have a, in our library, there's a whole graphic no novel uh, section uh, with comics as well. And uh, uh, Franzi kind of helps curate it, but the gal who is the librarian is just crazy over it. So it's not there already. So she's going to love it. <clears throat> well, cool. I think maybe I've jabbered yeah. enough. Should, could, does anybody want to? chat or ask a question yeah. Jonathan, in, in that last um one of the images from your your book there was a two two gentlemen there around a table and they were they looked like beer cans on the table um let me pull that, that up again you said your pieces were all from masonite those paintings and you and you peeled them off and then you showed them to the editor that one with the beer cans are those painted on in there or are they painted cut out and collaged on top of that table just a sec. Can you see my screen? Um, yeah. It says it's starting. Yep. Sorry about making you dig for that. Oh no, 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 not at all. I shouldn't. I shouldn't have closed it so soon. Can you see? Yeah, we we see your screen, but not the actual book. Oh, okay. Just a sec. <clears throat> I've got the book here. I should have just kept it open. Oops. That's when we're having the drinking contest. <laughs> okay. Let me try one more time here, just a quick sec. How about that? Yeah, we can see it. Cool, cool. Yeah, this one, I know which one you're talking about. Um, 100 beers on the year. Yeah. No, yeah, when I, as far as the, these are, um, unfor I found this, uh, uh, it's not canvas, it's a polyester. It was a quadruple primed polyester. So it was super thick, um, but it was super smooth, like a sheet of paper. And it was also super expensive. It was like 150 bucks a yard or something. Um, but that's what I started drawing all or doing all the paintings for the book on. And so, yeah, I mount them with just donuts of tape on the back of these sheets and then stick them up onto a masonite board just as a support. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, Franzi was wondering if it was collage or painted. No, this is just all straight painting. I think the, the, the weird toothy smile probably looks kind of collage, but it's just a painting and a drawing. Wow, they, they, the beer cans totally look collage, as did the ashtrays on the table and a, and a couple ones before. So I was, I was wondering, is that collage? Is there some digital work in there? But it's just all straight painting, you're saying? Yeah, just a pencil and acrylic paint, yep. Wow. And then I found years ago, um, I, the thing that painting was, so the, the challenge for me was um, you can always overpaint something. You can paint over it. You can tweak it. You can blah, blah, blah. And that would drive me crazy or, or trying to perfect something. I think that's why I intuitively am a pen and ink person because you have to commit to this mark and then you have to live with it and respond to it and then just go. It, it forces you to be direct and deliberate. And if you can do that with painting, of course, but with me, I would constantly be perfecting it or whatever. And so some of these like like splashy things. What I found was that I'd keep copies of old magazines next to my easel and I would put some color on a sheet from torn from a magazine and then smack that on the painting and then with a brayer hit it and then pull it off. And it'd be a way to like screw it up a little bit. And it was usually more interesting than if I did it neat. Beautiful stuff, man, thanks. Appreciate the question. Yeah, it's a lovely book. I 
like I say, it made me laugh and cry at the same time. And I've been to that area. I've done some camping in, in the National Park there. Beautiful country. I miss North Dakota. Mm -hmm. How about students? Is, is anybody? Yeah, they, they're all supposed to have some kind of a question for you. I'm, I'm scrolling down so I can see you all. I have a few questions. Um, my first question is, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay. My first question is, do you have any regrets as an artist? <clears throat> no, or no. not an artist, I guess. In terms of art or career stuff? Yeah. Whew, not, not yet. <laughs> Knock on wood. I think I think for I think for what when Matt when Maddie's talking about it's like there's so many now there just seems to be so many avenues you can go down. Yeah. And so do you many. look and do you look back and say I coulda shoulda you know? Am I no, paraphrasing I, that right, Maddie? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, uh, no, Maddie, it's Maddie, it's a it's a really good question. And and I think, you know, as I said, I've been in the classroom a lot the last 12 years, and especially now watching, you know, people of your generation, and there's so much visual noise, you know, and there's so much, you know, that notion of influence. Um, I mean, I, I kind of come from a generation that had one foot before the internet, and then obviously the internet blew up early in my career. Um, but you know, when I was in undergraduate like you, I would go to the library and in my dorm room, I had a five foot stack of books by my bed. And if no one would put a reserve on them, I would keep them all semester long, you know? <clears throat> and um, that's, I know what that sounds like. That sounds really weird now because if you have your phone, this is, this is your bookstore, right? Or your library. I think it's, um, Unfortunately, I think it really we have to be very disciplined these days um, because this is so amazing. This thing you have literally the Library of Alexandria, Egypt, you know, or whatever, right here. You know, you don't you have everything you need to do everything just with this, the camera, the whatever. Um, but using it as a tool, you know, and having the discipline that, yeah, I could I could play Animal Crossing for another 45 minutes, or I could sit in here and just aimlessly draw because I'm bored in a sketchbook or on a sheet of paper. Um, I think that is probably the, the, the toughest thing with your generation is allowing yourself time to be bored. No one's bored anymore. And no one's, everybody's, even now in this horrible quarantine and isolation and, and attending class like this is not ideal, but, um, Allow yourself time to be bored. What do you mean by bored? Like, like just time to disconnect or? It could, it could mean disconnecting, you know, internet stuff, but I think, you know, reading, I think, I think meaningful reading is a challenge for, and I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not passing judgment on you. Maybe you love to read, maybe you don't. <clears throat> um, Cause I, I think my, Helen and I, my wife and I were just talking about this the other night. She was reading some, a nonfiction book about octopuses that a friend had given her. And she was just saying how she, had, she hadn't been reading much the last couple of months. She's been doing a lot of work from home and stuff. And she was just saying it was, it was amazing, like just sitting there for an hour and a half reading because, and I said to her, we had this cool exchange. When you're online, when you're looking at something on this screen, your brain doesn't have to do it. It's doing it for you. It's showing you the universe. It's showing you that clothing, it's showing you whatever. When you read, it's instantly interactive because your brain has to make up what that person's nose looked like or that person's shoe or what that felt like. And I think that that might be a real loss culturally. And it's not, that's not even an age group thing. That's all of us. Yeah, I would agree. Um, it's, and so I don't, I, I guess I don't really think in terms of regret, um, uh, hopefully. Um, Keep going. <laughs> Doodling, yeah. Anybody else who's got a question for John? It's your time to. So, what art piece resonates with you the most? Say one time again, Zeta. What art piece resonates with you the most? Of mine or in general? Of of yours. 
Oh, that's the age old question. Like, what's your favorite song if you're a songwriter? Or what's your favorite book if you're a novelist? And then but what's like the most personal one that you've created? Oh, kind of all my babies, you know? Um, I feel you. No, but the Badland Saloon, which we've been talking about a lot, that I literally, the main character in the book is Oliver Clay, is his name. But up until the very last edit and it went to press, we changed, it was Johnny. So it was like almost a straight, like Henry Miller autobiographical thing. So that one's very, very close to my heart. Um, the Badland Saloon, I think. But on some level, um, that's cool. Yeah. They all feel kind of autobiographical, you know, on some level, just as just as Marx or something. I have a question, John. Are you are you doing some writing now? Uh, yeah, every day. Um, one thing I've tried to do a little bit more of, and I've actually got a, a, a couple of pitch decks. That's the other thing of being an artist, whether it's a gallery artist or commercial, is you gotta you gotta get your stuff in front of the right people, and that's almost a full time job aside from the art making. Um, and so I've got a couple of pitches um, to editors at magazines. I've tried to use my Instagram account. It's largely sketchbook focused work. And I've been writing these, I've been calling them micro essays, you know, so there's like, what is it, 2100 characters on Instagram, the limit. And so like writing a little passage that either um, I do a drawing to a company or I write something to a company, a drawing that already exists and making the Instagram posts kind of a little micro essay. And so I, and I love the short form. When I was in college, I loved poetry because of its form. It's an experience you can have in like one sitting, whereas reading Infinite Jest is like running three marathons back to back to back. Um, Who else? Come on. We were supposed to have a question. I can ask more questions. Wait, is that Z Zazie? Is that how you say your name? Yeah. Oh, there, I, were you talking? Yeah, I'm sorry. What, could you not hear me? I think your mic might have been on for a second. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just curious. I noticed in a lot of your, your pieces, you'll do either like a splotch of color, usually like red or an overlaying of the Bendet do dots and your pieces. What, what exactly is that the intention behind like that stylistic choice? I've been publishing this series of catalog collections. And those are the dots you're, you're referring to, I think. It's cool, you know, Bendet dots. Most people don't know what that is anymore. Um, maybe for your classmates, Bendet dots like one example of their usage was like political cartoonists in newspapers, black and white work. Dots used to come on physical sheets and different size of dots. And so it would create a half tone on the printed page for newspapers. Um, this was just a textured uh, like craft paper. I found at an art supply store like 20 years ago. And it's, it's kind of like a, a craft paper that's got a waffle texture. And when I was painting, I found that if I did the acrylic paint and then smacked it down on something, you get almost Bende dots, but it's a little messed up. And this collection is exactly what you were just talking about. It's called Graffiti Drawings. There's a, a short essay at the beginning where I explain what, it, what, what it's all about. But um, um, I, I keep a stack of paper in my studio that it's, it's blank sheets that I'll occasionally go and like run a brayer across one or I'll drop some watercolor on another one, or I'll put a coffee stain on one. And then at night, I'll sometimes sit down and just randomly grab a sheet and just you know start to draw on one of these marred sheets of paper um, and either respond to like what's happening in the abstractness or just drawing like right over the top of a brayer. And um, it's, yeah, um, it's, it's, I've always had a hard time of just creating something out of whole cloth, like just like, okay, go, you know, like, oh. Um, so this is a way to like um, have stuff happen, you know, it kind of gets the conversation started. So that's a great, great question. Anybody else? So um, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. 
Pick a number. Who went first? Go ahead, Not Avery. Sure. Go ahead, Avery. You go first and then or Jenna and Okay. Uh so I know you use a lot of ink. Uh what specific like uh do a lot of like tiny strokes. What do you use for like your little detailing, like specifically? Do you have like a go-to like pen that you use? This is the one cool thing about doing these things from home is I can like just turn around and like show you guys all sorts of stuff. There's a, a company called Lamy, L-A-M-Y, which I've been, I'm not sponsored by, so I'm not, this doesn't benefit me in any way, but they make these, these pens, which I started out with is, it's called a Lamy Safari. And the reason it's called Safari was it's a fountain pen, which was, um, marketed to encourage young people to get excited about drawing with a fountain pen. So they called it a safari, like going on an adventure. And you can get a few different nibs with it and different nib sizes. And the cool thing about the pen is it, for like four bucks extra, you can get this converter, it's called. And what this is, is a little plunger that you screw down and then you can put this in whatever ink you want and then pull the ink into the converter. So you know, you can refill it constantly. And, and my red pen has my red ink in it. So, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> but then um, regardless of the size of the nib, what I've done, and then this is the Lamy Ion. It's an aluminum pen, which I really like because it has a little, little weight to it. When I'm drawing, Avery, have, do you draw with a, a fountain pen ever? Uh, I actually started with like uh, painting, so I've just started with like inking. Okay. So but yeah, you know, that's with, why I asked. With a fountain pen, there's like the proper way to hold it, you know, in terms of how the nib touches the mm -hmm. paper. Well, if you flip it upside down the wrong way, it actually draws with a really thin line. And so I found that with just the one nib, I can draw thick in what, holding it one way, but then if I wanted to do a real fine cross hatching, I can flip it upside down the so-called wrong way and get a fine line without changing pens, just using the same nib. And then if you hold it like this, straight up and down, you'll get a, a thinner line. Whereas if you hold it more flush with the paper, it'll have a broader line. Um, Nice. I, guess while, I guess while we're talking shop, I might as well. Um, and this is the ink I use. It's plat. It's platinum brand carbon black. It's a Japanese ink, about $20 for this bottle. The reason I use it is it doesn't have shellac in it. And so it won't clog your fountain pens. And it's almost totally waterproof. A lot of like Higgins and a lot of different inks say waterproof, but there'll be that slight ghost of a blue or whatever when you, if you do watercolor over the top. And so this is on Amazon, you can get it. Thank you. Jenna, did you have something? Um, yeah, so um, I noticed that you do a lot of um, political work for um, like newspapers and magazines. And I'm wondering like, what your process is in terms of like, have you ever done a piece um, for an article maybe that you didn't personally politically agree with or do you choose not to do pieces for articles that you don't agree with? Yeah, that, that comes up all the time, obviously. Um, and especially in, in our very politically divided, um, <clears throat> whatever you call it. Um, sure, um, but one thing I would say there is it's kind of like, the, the, the Deal Business Magazine, I showed you that cover earlier. Um, those articles are just boring as hell. They're like hyper financial. And so I tend to approach the material, whether it's about Trump or whether it's about a bankruptcy court decision, like just at, like what, what is the thing here that this article is trying to do? And then how can I create a picture that sort of runs on a parallel track with the article? if that makes sense, rather than literally illustrating whatever the thing is. I, I find that I'm more likely to end up with an interesting image that way than if I like just, you know, try to be blatant about this or that. Um, I, I turn, I've only turned down like two things ever. Um, and one of them was a cover for the New Republic. 
uh, they, the art director called, this was years ago when John McCain was running for president. I don't know if you guys even remember John McCain at this point, but the art director who I'd worked with before, we had a great working relationship. He called and he's like, John, I want you to do a picture of John McCain smoking a cigar made of hundred dollar bills. Um, and I was like, oh man. And it had nothing to do with me, like, cause I liked John McCain or didn't. It was more like, it was just kind of a tired idea. And then I thought, well, would you have done a portrait of John Kerry smoking a cigar, a cigar rolled up of hundred dollar bills? Or, and again, you guys might not know who John Kerry is. His wife is Teresa Hines Kerry, who has the Hines fortune of, of um, ketchup. And John McCain married Cindy McCain, who inherited the Budweiser distribution in Southwest United States. So they both sort of married into really big money. Um, but anyway, that's the only political thing I can think of. And even that wasn't so much about politics as it was um, it's just kind of a tired idea. And the editors were really hell bent on doing that one thing. So he and I, the art director called me, you know, the next month or a couple months later, it wasn't as though I had burned a bridge over that one job, but. Um, John, I have the students, my introduction students working on the Moleskin accordion book, the Japanese oh, awesome. pulled out book. And uh, you have some wonderful examples of that. And, you know, this week they're kind of struggling as to what they should do with it, you know, so. Um, well, you came to the right place. I'm not too sure if you have any insight for them, but. Uh, um, I told them there has, to, there has to be a theme running through that it, in the end, it you know, it looks like a storyline. Here's one that I started, you guys, over uh, early in the pandemic. And I just started by drawing a coffee cup. Let's see how I can do this. And then I had an angel. And then the angel's reaching out to somebody who kind of looks like me. And then they go into a shopping mall and then and then there's some masks and then there's the new york skyline and then an upside down head and then bruce lee that might be the one if you guys are having trouble on these accordion books then there's a great white shark and then there's a rodeo at madison square garden and then we're done. Um, one trick that I use with these accordion books, you guys, is you might draw a coffee cup on the first page and then just fast forward to the very middle and don't even look which spreads you're on and start drawing your feet on your bed with your laptop in your lap. And then maybe go to the last page and draw the empty coffee cup on its side. And then the next day, maybe go to another blank page randomly and start drawing something. And after you've done a few of the spreads, open the thing up and start connecting the elements. And you'll maybe have one of those aha moments like, oh, wow, Bruce Lee just got eaten by a great white shark or something. <laughs> That's wonderful. Anybody else so we can let John off the hook? I'm sure he's got many other things he should be doing. Probably the weirdest medium you've ever worked with. Ah, that's easy. When I was in, um, well, this is a stupid story. When I was in high school, and this, and it dates me. And I, do you guys remember who Vanilla Ice is? Ice Ice Baby. Yeah. Well, yeah. he came to Bismarck, and in the '90s, there wasn't. This is early '90s. There wasn't a lot of stuff happening in Bismarck, North Dakota. It was pre-internet, so me and some pals went to see Vanilla Ice. Um, and the music was just insanely loud, of course, but what, what I came away with was the, the stage set had these big drapes that were airbrushed to look like graffiti and stuff. And then all the dancers had matching airbrushed clothing. And I was like, that's cool. And so I went home, my dad was a high school art teacher, so he had lots of different art supplies, including a compressor and a couple of airbrushes. So I bought some fabric paint and I started airbrushing t-shirts and jeans. Um, and warm to school, 
And then the kids at school were like, that's cool. Can I get one? And then I started charging $10 per side of a leg. So 10, 20, 30, 40 for one, two, three, four, front and back. I still have the log book. I made, you know, a couple grand in high school, just airbrushing clothes. And I started to do that. And here's the answer is I, I continued to do that when I was a freshman in college in my dorm room. And a girl brought me a pair of panties one time to do. And she told me what she wanted on them. And I had an old basketball. So I stretched the underwear on the basketball as a stencil and airbrushed the under, undergarment. That's the weirdest. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good story. No, it's fun. I guess I, I've just always been mad about drawing and, and, and telling stories. So, yeah. Thank you, John. Um, Jason Flack is with us too. He's the one that sort of uh, orchestrated the, the whole contract for us. So we'll, we'll both stay on it. Make sure we get get paid. Yeah, Jason. If there's not, if 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 there are any holes in any of that stuff, just shoot me an email and we'll tidy it up. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, been great. A great afternoon. Or is well, that given these times, just seeing your, your, your students, you, you know, at, at home or in your dorm or wherever you are, this is like, it's like social interaction, man. This is awesome. <laughs> now students. Be, now they don't, be, they don't like it. Most of them don't like it. No, they'd I rather don't. be, they'd rather be in a classroom messing around, you know, of course, of course, but it's a way I try to make it fun, you know, and uh, so far we've been having fun. One, one thing, I guess, just a parting thing that I would suggest to your students is, um, you know, Kathy just reached out to me uh, on Facebook. You know, if, if any of you are really serious about illustration or about comic books or about writing, um, and you have a favorite, if you have a George Saunders or a I mean, George is probably a little bit hard to get a hold of, but, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, don't just email and say, hey, what do you what do you think about writing or something? But if you had a very specific thing, like about a tool or about a specific story, um, you might be surprised how many people are sitting in a room by themselves working on stuff and might respond. That happened uh, when you talk about Philip Burke. Um... I was the gallery director for 35 years at Mercer Gallery at Monroe Community College. Now Jason's doing the job as I'm semi-retired. Um, but I just kind of approached Philip Burke one day and said, would you, would you consider having a show? And he said, yeah, definitely. So he shows up with a big station wagon with these big giant uh, paintings. And at that time he was doing things for um, the Village Voice and Vanity Magazine. And they were just like little paintings like in the back of these Village Voice things. But these things were gigantic. So he worked so large back then in those, in those days. And uh, it just kind of, you know, threw me off a little bit. But He still does. Yeah, um, it's just like crazy. But yeah, I, I see him from time to time, but um, really energized you know great great artist if you see him say hi he'd um the the trump piece that i had put up a couple months ago he sent me a really sweet note on facebook and you know i've admired his work since i was 17 so i'm like philip burke liked it yeah. oh man <clears throat> yeah, he's a good guy yeah. we're uh we're bringing in uh donald collie next month i don't know if you know his work but he's uh somebody that uses uh the same kind of idea, you know, an open sketchbook using both pages as a, as one picture plane, and uh, he's sponsored by uh, fiber cassell markers and you know, oh, cool. different paper things. But I guess if he knew you, he said no. So maybe the two of you have to meet sometime. But he's out of Chicago now. Okay. And he's on Facebook and Instagram and all that. I think the two of you would like each other. He does some uh, really wonderful uh, portraitures. Sweet. Okay, guys. You good? I just have one more question. Do you have any pets? <laughs> pet <know>. peeves? <laughs> uh, no, I've, I've house sat a cat for a friend of mine years ago, but no, no, no pets. 
<laughs> Maddie. Okay. She's probably just wondering why the cat wasn't running around. Uh, all right, I have guys. a question. Go for it. Um, now, when the story of the brush strokes of like the clothing that you did back in high school, do you ever regret uh, making that not into a business today? <laughs> It's interesting, this regret thing, that's a theme. Everybody's asking about regret. Now, I, I feel, do you guys know Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk on social? He's always giving life advice to young people. I feel like Gary V now. But um, no, and here's, here's the thing too, Chris. Uh, I've never thought about it like in terms of money. And for better or for worse, you know, I, I think there, it, and this isn't really a regret, Maddie, but um, th that's definitely one thing. And, well, I've kind of prided myself on, I don't see the business side of art as being a dirty word. Like some artists are like, oh, I can't be bothered. I just have to paint. Um, and I've never been like that because pr presumably we care about the work we make and we want other people to see it, you know, and that's where self-promotion comes in and, you know, that stuff. But at the end of the day, I just want to draw. And, um, and so the, the airbrushing thing was cool for a while. Um, and then I've done caricatures at outdoor art festivals around the upper Midwest. But um, no, I don't regret it. Um, maybe I would have been richer or something. <laughs> Designing your own clothes. <clears throat> I, I could add to that. He probably would make really good money up until about 1994. <laughs> And then by 95, when everybody realized airbrushing pants was so, you know, early 90s, he would have gone broke. So he's probably made the wise choice. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that'll do it. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, we'll stay in touch. And uh, it's just been a wonderful afternoon. Let's see if we can do applause. Maybe we can all, in, you know, like, kind of like they do in it's RIT. <laughs> It's really been awesome speaking with you guys. Uh, keep in touch. Yeah. Thanks so much. Bye. Have a good day.